Welcome back and good evening ladies, gents and Pikachus, beloveds of the internet. I am your host Daily Corvid and I'm going to be reading you my favourite book of all time, the New Testament, the entire Holy Bible page by page, the entire testament of our Lord Jesus Christ, the original disciples, the apostles and the saints. We're going to be beginning with the first book, the Gospel of Matthew, and then we're going to be going through it verse by verse and trying to understand as much of the Lord's grace as we possibly can. We'll be using the Revised Standard Edition, translated from the original Greek, circa 1611. And before we start, I just want to take this chance to say to you, may the Lord bless you now and for all the days to come. So without further ado, let's get started. So, the Gospel according to Matthew commences with a short genealogy of Jesus Christ, which means an accurate hierarchy of his earthly descendants. So what that is, is like a list of... This guy is the father of this guy, is the father of this guy, is the father of this guy, and these are his sons. And the reason they do this, even though people whiz past this and they think it's not important, I've been guilty of this myself. The reason this has to be in here, this proves a physical, this is like a physical record of why these guys are important to the Old Testament and how the Old Testament links to this. So this is how we know Jesus is definitely Jesus, and these guys are definitely his prophets. First number one. The book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So as you can see, that gives us a little bit of work to get on with straight away, even though it's only one short verse. Because now we have to say, how is Jesus the son of David? Is that even possible? We, we thought Jesus was a virgin birth, like he shouldn't be the son of anybody. And who is Abraham? Why is Abraham important to this story, despite the fact that it's about Jesus? So, with that in mind, let's take a trip down memory lane into history and find out just who these guys really were. In the Old Testament, and also actually in the New Testament, God made a covenant with King David of Israel after many troubles, and promised him that his throne in Israel would be established forever. And that's why, even today, Israel is called the City of David. And through this covenant and the fulfilment of God's promise, the messianic title Son of David was created and applied to Jesus Christ, who was called the Anointed One, the Son of David, many times throughout the Old Testament. And in fact, when people were calling on him to heal the sick or the blind or to create miracles to help them out, they addressed him as the son of David because he was the son of the city of David created through the covenant made with God. Goliath of Gath was a, a Philistine champion who sought the destruction of Israel and had attacked it for over a month. I think it was like 44 days or something. His great size and aggression feared the Israelites greatly and at this time David was just a teenager. He was just 16 years old, certainly not a warrior. But David showed great faith and courage to leave the safety of the walls of Israel and face this heavily armoured champion using a simple sling and a rock. And his victory revealed to the Israelites once again that God's covenant with Abraham is fulfilled through miracle. Now the keen-eyed amongst you will recognise David is not a direct son of Abraham, he's a son through descendancy. David was a distant descendant of Abraham through his many sons, again in keeping with God's original covenant with him. In fact there are 13 generations of sons beyond Abraham up to King David who slew Goliath. And that is why from Abraham you have 13 generations, then you have David as the 14th, and then David has 14 further generations leading up to the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem, which is the city of David. And that is how we know Jesus Christ is the son of the city of David and the Messiah who will sit upon the eternal throne. So we start to build up a picture of how important this Davidic line of succession is and why it was so important it appears on the very first verse of the New Testament. Here we can see the Davidic line of succession and all of these people have been factually documented in history in some way to actually exist and to lead one to the next. So through looking at this line of succession it becomes clear with the knowledge of history why this succession is so important to the story of Jesus Christ that it precedes every other part and verse and appears in that very first verse. This is the trail of blood proofs 
that God is continuing to keep his covenant with Abraham and his sons, not with death, but through life, through the living. And so we know God is the God of the living, and also we're going to see that God promises David an eternal dynasty in Israel. So that clears up verse 1, why David is so important and appears in the first line, and why Abraham therefore is the patriarch of the entire religion who links together the New and the Old Testaments through the covenant with God and God's completion and fulfilment of that prophecy, leading to Jesus Christ being born and sitting upon the throne as the eternal holy anointed one, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. That's why we worship him. That's what that means. In summary of verse 1, just the first verse of the New Testament, we can see a physical, provable, unbroken blood link from Abraham through David all the way to Jesus Christ on the eternal throne. And we know there is two really important reasons for this. Obviously, the first one is to prove the genealogy of Jesus Christ as the son of David, who is the son of Abraham through his descendants. But the second reason is to shut the door on a future false doctrine, a false prophecy and a false Christ. And we know we have seen that guy appearing in the Quran, Isa ibn Allah, the false Jesus. And so we can finally move on to verse number two. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And so we are asked the question, who is Isaac? Who is Isaac, son of Abraham, and why is he so important in the biblical stories? So Isaac happens to be one of the most important people in both Judaism and Christianity, and also Islam try to get their awe in and steal him away as one of their prophets. So he's known as a patriarch, and this is because Isaac is the direct grandfather of all the 12 tribes of Israel. And once again, through the scriptures, we are shown how incredibly important it is for the truth of this document to be preserved, that we know the blood link from Abraham to Isaac to Judah, the progenitor of the, tri the tribe of Judah, who then has a son called Jacob. And Jacob, through his meeting with God and his promise with God, becomes Israel and sets up Israel, of which David will later be the king of. And finally, Judah's brothers are the 12 patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we know how important the tribes of Israel are to the rest of the biblical canon. And we're going to find out as we read through this book, each one in turn, what their particular stories are and the relevance for all of these great men to the current day story and our lives as worshippers of Christ. Effectively, what the New Testament is doing here is giving us the full knowledge of the line of succession here, so that when we finally reach the verses up ahead, we will already know the people and the reason they have such prominence. And that brings us neatly to verse 3, the final verse of today's reading, which is a continuation of 2. So, 3. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. So Judah, the fourth son of Jacob, you know, the guy who becomes Israel through God's instruction, Judah is the leader of the tribe who create the settlement of Judea, which becomes the home of the Jews, and that's how Judea gets its name, which gives his sons the slang name the Jews. So that's how the Jews are first created. Judah is the first Jew. Now, Judah ends up married to Tamar, which is this Israelite woman here, who was endowed with a gift of prophecy, widowed by Ur, and then married again to Judah through a Levite tradition. Now, these days, we might think it a little bit weird if you marry the wife of your dead brother. But back then, the Levite culture was actually doing this as a protection for the widow by having them married to the surviving brother of their dead husband. And through this union, Tamar becomes Judah's wife. And she bears him the sons, Perez and Zerah, who are twins. After that, Perez bears a son called Hezron, and Hezron bears a son called Ram. As to what happens to Zerah, the second twin, because he was born second, that means he doesn't have the birthright to carry on the descendancy line. And so he becomes a footnote in the biblical tale. 
Now, before I lose your attention completely, just keep in mind, the reason why we are being taught this is so that we can see actual examples in history, recorded through scriptures, of how faith and morals, and therefore our behaviour, can affect our lives, and not only our own lives, but the lives of our children, through the actions that we demonstrate to them in the way that God is demonstrating this to us. So in summary then of everything that we've learned just from three verses, the first three verses of the New Testament, we learn that A. Guiding our children well, as God has shown in his examples through Abraham, through David and through Jesus Christ, is the main principle we learn from those first three verses. To look after ourselves and our lives and the world because we are going to give it to our children and they are going to have children who will inherit it from them. B. Recognising that God's covenant made with our forefathers, the patriarchs, also covers our lives and the lives of our children. And C. God's gift to us reaches us through both blood, the birthright given to us, and also the spirit, the expression of our lives. And everything we do really matters. So, that's about all we have time for today. If you're going to take one lesson and one lesson only from this, read the Holy Bible, learn the wisdom that God is trying to give you, and when you have picked up that wisdom and you put it into your own life, you'll go on to bigger and better things, and you'll have a joyous, creative, good experience of life. So, that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed that and you learned something. God bless you all. Have a great evening, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye now.